One of the great questions of, of history, human history, that historians ponder still today, is how did Christianity rise to such power and prominence in the ancient world? How, how did this obscure, marginal Jesus movement in the Roman world become the dominant religious force in the Western world that's really remarkable if you think about it. We don't often think back. We think of the church today as an institutional thing across the globe with lots of power and prestige maybe, or maybe it's waning in some parts of the world, but we think of it as a big sort of monolithic thing. But it started as a small sect within Judaism, oppressed and persecuted by the dominant empire in the world, Rome. How did it, how did it last? How did it win, as it were? If you're interested in reading about this kind of thing, I would recommend a book to you by a man named Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity, where he, from a sociologist's perspective, he's a Christian, but he's writing from a, a secular historian's perspective about how did this happen. And former Yale professor of history, Kenneth Scott Lauderette, writes this. The more one examines the various factors which seem to account for the extraordinary victory of Christianity, the more one is driven to search for a cause underlying them all. It is clear that at the very beginning of Christianity, there must have been or must have occurred a vast release of energy, virtually unequaled in history. Without it, the future course of this religious movement is inexplicable. Why this occurred may lie outside the realm in which modern historians are supposed to move. I love this. He's saying, we really can't figure it out. There's lots of sociological interesting things and some anthropological things we can study, but we don't really know. In fact, all we can say is something happened. There was a massive release of energy at the beginning. And why this happened, we really can't dive into. Because this, is, this vast release of energy is exactly what the book of Acts tells us about. It explains and gives the answer for that which historians can't quite figure out and what they look into. The, the, these chapters in the book of Acts, Acts is the story of the Acts of the Apostles, is what it means. It's oddly named, or oddly titled, but it really could be the Acts of the, of the Holy Spirit, and it is the story of the birth of the church. Luke wrote Luke's gospel, obviously, and he also wrote Acts. So he's got like part one and part two of his story. Part one is the story of Jesus, Luke's account of the life of, and death of, and resurrection of Jesus. And then part two is Luke wrote Acts, which is the story of the birth of the church, which we're a part of. So let's open, if you have your Bible, to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. We'll read a portion of chapter 1 and a portion of chapter 2 and see what, what happened here. Acts 1, verse 4. This is, Jesus has died and been resurrected, but has not yet ascended to heaven. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. These are among the last words Jesus spoke to his followers before he ascended. The last things he says to them. He tells them that they're going to be his witnesses. They're going to do great and miraculous things. But he says first, what does he tell them to do? What does he tell them to do? Anybody catch it? Nothing pretty much, right? Just sit tight. Wait. Because something, someone is coming. Now the last couple weeks in our series on the Holy Spirit, we looked at what's called the farewell discourse. The goodbye conversation, if you, as it were. Between Jesus and his closest followers in the upper room at the Last Supper in John 14, 15, and 16 where he describes that he says, and actually you heard Andrew last week tell you that it's for your benefit I go away. Remember this? Jesus says to his followers, it's actually good for you that I go away. Can you imagine being one of the 12 and thinking, how can that possibly be? I mean, far be it for me to question you, Jesus, but I don't think that's right. You're going to leave us now when we need you most? And Jesus says, yes, because if I don't, you won't receive the Holy Spirit. So whoever the Holy Spirit is, Jesus is saying it's better for you to have the Spirit inside of you than me right next to you. You believe that? Jesus says that the Spirit of God in you is better than the Son of God beside you. 
Now, how many of you haven't thought at one time in your life, yeah, but I know that might be true intellectually, but I've always thought if I could just see a miracle, see Jesus raise Lazarus or see him feed the 5,000 or just maybe hang out with him and have a fish dinner with him, I could just, if I could just hang with Jesus, my faith would be stronger. How many of you haven't thought that? If your hands are up, you're not listening to me probably, right? <laughs> right? But Jesus says, actually, no. Your faith will be stronger if I go. Because one just like me will reside in your heart and in your life. That's remarkable to me. I'm still learning what this means in my own life. I think we are as a church. And here in, in Acts 1, he's saying, wait, because what I promised you is about to happen. What I said is about to happen and come true. Today, where we looked at, this, at the spirit of presence and the spirit of, of truth. Jesus is present with us by the Holy Spirit. He guides us into all truth, and now we look at the spirit of power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 now and see what actually took place. Verses 1 through 12. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Now we'll get to the, the tongues of fire and the speaking of tongues a little bit later. But this is the answer to the question, how did Christianity do it? How did it survive? How did it grow and become the dominant religious force in the Western world down to today? How did the church make it? This is the answer right here. It's not something you can study purely from a secular, sociological, historical point of view. We're being told. Now, before, what's happening here is something new, something that God hasn't done this way before. How many of you have watched, like, zombie apocalypse movies? Bear with me, right? Or, 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 or like, end-of-the-world type movies, right? When I was a kid, it was, it was war games, global, thermal, nuclear war, you know? And, or, or maybe in, in, like, the 90s or the early 2000s, it was, like, outbreak movies, like, about a, a terrible plague, you know? Or, and now it's the zombie stuff. But the point is, whenever we watch these movies, there's always some government group in a room with a giant digitized map of the world. You know what I'm talking about? They always have this scene. And on that map, there's always, like, a, a dot that shows, like, where it begins. Like, this is where the outbreak started. This is where the bomb fell. This is where the first zombie happened or whatever, right? And they show, like, the circles coming out from there and the time line and how long it will be till we're all infected. Or, you know what I mean? Are you with me? Is just, do I, am I the only one who watches these movies? Okay. <laughs> There's a point. What's happening here in Acts 2 is, is that on the good scale. Like something's happening. Boom. The epicenter. Remember what Jesus said in Acts 1.8? In fact, Acts 1.8, let's go there. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in where? Say it with me. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth. What's that sound like? Boom! Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Like this is the epicenter, he's saying, of what God's going to do called the church. And it's going to change the world. So the pouring out of tongues, this miraculous moment is like the boom. Something's happening here. That hasn't happened before. Prior to this moment, the Holy Spirit is always, it's the third person of the Trinity, it's always been present at creation, brooding over the surface of the deep, breathing life into God's creatures, and it's always been present. But now something unique is happening. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come on people in power, like Samson to defeat the Philistines, or at times to fill Elijah the prophet so he could prophesy. But it wasn't a complete and permanent filling all the time. The Spirit would come and go as God determined that people needed him in unique ways. Now we're being told that all who belong to Jesus, all who trust in him for forgiveness of sin and turn over their life to him, receive the Spirit poured out. That means you and me. This has not happened before. Something unique is happening. 
This is the vast release of energy that Scott Lauderette wrote about or wondered about. Think about it for a minute. These are the same individuals. Matthew, Mark, right? Peter, James, John. These are the same 12 individuals who just two, less than two months, 50 days earlier, because Pentecost is 50 days from Passover. What happened to Passover? Crucifixion, death, right? Put to death by Pontius Pilate, but he was leveraged by the Sanhedrin, the high council. These are the same men who ran away, denied Jesus, pretended they didn't know him, fled, ran away and hid. The same guys, less than two months later, now are these bold witnesses in Jerusalem, the same city. What changed? What's different? Well, the resurrection happened. That's pretty big. But they had seen the risen Jesus for a number of days now. What changed is the Spirit. Jesus says, wait, wait. The Spirit my Father promised is going to come, and you'll receive power to be my witnesses. This, this Acts 1.8 is the key verse for the whole story of Acts. This is power. Okay, what kind of power? Power to do what? First, power to believe in Jesus. Power to believe in Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we didn't read this. Luke says in his account that Jesus came and reminded them of everything he'd started, that he taught them. He appeared to them by many proofs. And it's this, it's this conviction and being convinced of who Jesus is that leads them to become powerful witnesses. In other words, you don't receive the power of the Holy Spirit in your life until you are convinced and convicted of the truth of who Jesus Christ is. I have a good friend that says we live in a time when people want the kingdom without the king. I think he's right. Let me explain what he means. If the kingdom of God is love and joy and peace and righteousness and justice and mercy and goodness, don't, who doesn't want that in the world today? Which of you wouldn't say we need that? But if the king means surrender, acknowledging that, I'm, I, that I have allegiance to him, that he has rights over my life, that I'm sinful and I need to repent of my sin and be forgiven, I don't know if I want that. You can't have the kingdom without the king. They go together. And when Jesus says you'll receive power, the first thing he says is power to what? Believe in who he is. To be convinced of and convicted of his love and his mercy and his grace. All the things we were just singing about. This is the primary job of the Holy Spirit. We've been saying this the last couple weeks. Everybody wants to talk about the tongues, and I promise we will, both this morning and, and in weeks to come. We get to the gifts of the Spirit. Everybody wants to talk about the miraculous stuff, the healings and the hocus pocus stuff of the Spirit. The primary job of the Spirit is not that stuff. The primary role of the Spirit is to make Jesus Christ real to you. To, in your heart, give you a rock-solid certainty that he is who he says he was. That he is the risen king. That he is reigning. That he will return. That he has forgiven my sin. That I do belong to him. That he is the only hope of the world. That all can come to the Father only through him. That all that's true. To convince you in your heart. That's the big job of the Holy Spirit. That's the real miracle. Real power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian is not magic words or miracles. It's to be deeply convinced of the truth of Jesus Christ. Let me read to you. You're probably wondering, like, where's the C.S. Lewis quote? <laughs> hey, I'm glad you asked. In the, in the book Prince Caspian, one of the Narnian Chronicles, and if you, how many of you read the, the Narnian Chronicles? Really? I'm not doing my job here. Oh, my goodness. So Lucy is the youngest of the four Pevensey children, and she's the first one to experience Narnia, goes to the wardrobe, first one to see it. She sort of has a special relationship with Aslan. Aslan, by the way, is the Turkish word for lion, which is cool, but it's also the Christ figure in the story. So Aslan is the Christ figure. Lucy is, has a special relationship with Aslan, a Christ figure, unique to all the other children. And in Prince Caspian, Aslan appears to her and says, you'll see me, and I'll tell you where to go, and you must follow. And that happens. She sees him on a far hillside, and she tells the other, her brothers and sister, her brothers and sister, hey, there he is, but they don't see Aslan. And they get this argument. She's like, he's right there. We have to follow him. And they disagree because it's dangerous crossing this ravine. And they choose to go another way. And she follows them instead of Aslan. Even though she was knew he was there and was convinced and saw him. She couldn't convince her friends, her, her brothers and sister. And then they have this conversation when Aslan appears to her later. Aslan says, if you go back to the others now and wake them up and tell them you have seen me again, 
and that you must all get up at once and follow me, what will happen? There is only one way of finding out, dear. Do you mean that is what you want me to do, gasped Lucy? Yes, little one, said Aslan. But will the others see you too this time? Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh dear, oh dear, said Lucy, and I was so pleased at finding you again, and I thought you'd let me stay, and I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away like last time, and now everything is going to be just horrid. I know it's hard for you, little one, said Aslan, but things never happen the same way twice. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide it from his face, but there must have been magic in his mane. She could feel lion strength flowing into her. Quite suddenly, she sat up. I'm sorry, Aslan, she said, wiping away the tears. I'm ready now. Now you are a lioness, said Aslan, and all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. Here's the point of this story, I think, that relates to the Holy Spirit. Lucy knew who Aslan was and saw him and was convinced, but she didn't follow. Why? Why? Because of the opinion of others, right? Because her brothers and her sister didn't see and didn't believe. So she didn't obey. And when she says, but they won't believe me, as then, what does he say? It doesn't matter. You must follow. The primary job of the Holy Spirit in your life is to convince you of the reality of Jesus so much that it doesn't matter what people think around you. That it doesn't matter what they say at work or in your extended family or at school. That you're so convinced of who Jesus is that you're going to follow him. That's the big job. Power. First power is to believe in him, to be convinced of him. Second, power to live like Jesus. The Holy Spirit's not just trying to make you intellectually convinced, but to transform you, to change you, to make you new. Paul says in Galatians 4.19, I'm in the pains of childbirth. Now, how would the Apostle Paul know? But anyway, until Christ is formed in you. To change the way you think, convince you intellectually, so that you're changed in your life transformed. These are what theologians call regeneration and sanctification, right? I'm re I believe in Jesus. I surrender my life to him. I'm regenerate. I'm born again. And then I'm being sanctified, meaning I live like him increasingly. I leave behind my old life. I walk in, in the spirit. I become somebody that I wasn't before. The power of the Holy Spirit in you enables you to, in the words of the late Dallas Willard, philosopher and theologian, live as Jesus would live if he were in your place. So first, power to believe. Second, power to live. Isn't this what Romans 12 tells us, right? Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. You think different, you live different. How many of you have seen the movie Father of the Bride? Who is the Martin Short character? Frank? Remember the wedding coordinator, Frank? Really? <laughs> and he says, he's a genius and we need his mind. <laughs> Whatever I say, that, that's not part of the sermon or anything, but... Right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. <laughs> but the point is to convince you of who Jesus is so your life changes. The, he's more real to you than your, than your Instagram followers. He's more real to you than the number of likes you have or your 401k or your career trajectory or the stuff that happened to you in your past or the guilt you're, and shame you're harboring over something that you've done or the bitterness over something done to you. That Jesus is more real than any of that. He's your new reality. Now, later in the series, we'll talk about what that looks like when we get to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. But you see the progression there, I hope. Power to believe in who he is. Power to live the way he would live if he were in your place. Now, in this uh, idea of living that way, Rodney Stark, and I mentioned the book Rise of Christianity, he points out one of the key distinctions of the early Christians in the first century in Roman Empire, first and second century, they were heavily persecuted. And he said they, they, looked, they lived differently. They didn't just believe different things. There were lots of other religions floating around but they lived differently than the rest of the culture. He says, the Greco-Roman culture of the ancient world was marked by a number of things. One was people in the ancient world were promiscuous with their bodies. They slept with anybody. Gave, gave, they were promiscuous with, and generous with their bodies sexually, but they were radically um, ungenerous with their wealth. He said the early Christians were precisely the opposite. They were, they were different sexually. They didn't give themselves to anyone. They had a radical, radically biblical sexual ethic, but they were remarkably generous with their wealth and their time and their attention. 
They gave money away and cared for people that weren't part of their group. They didn't sleep with everybody. In other words, we look and live different than the culture. The, po- the Spirit comes on us in power, not to make you like everybody else, not to make you acquiesce and become the same as the culture, but to so convince you of Jesus that you live differently and people notice. I don't know what's going on over there, but that guy's different. Like the woman, Cindy, I mentioned a moment ago, who said, I think different now. Yeah, transformed by the renewing of your mind. They live differently. Let me look at verses 8 through 13 of Acts chapter 4. I seriously need to get glasses. <laughs> then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, before I read the last verse, this is amazing. This is Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times when a peasant girl outside the high priest's home said, oh, you talk like the Galileans, you must know him. No, I don't know him. And he ran away and wept bitterly. Now, just... <laughs> Less than two months later, the same guy is speaking to the same group he ran away from, the high council. And he's saying, oh, you want to know why we healed this guy? Because of Jesus, the one you killed. Where did this courage come from? Where did it come from? Now look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, <laughs> ah, it's like magic, <laughs> and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. Now let me ask you a question. Hadn't Peter been with Jesus before this? Hadn't he been with Jesus for three years before Jesus died? Remember what Jesus says, it's better for you that I go away. Because one just like me is coming to live in your heart. In other words, you'll be with me in a more powerful and personal and intimate way through the Spirit than you would be if I was standing next to you. And that's what's happening to Peter. It's a different guy. He didn't suddenly learn something new or go through some course in two months. The Spirit has come into his life. He's not afraid anymore. Why? Because Jesus is more real to him now than he was when he was standing on earth. Isn't that amazing? I'm not afraid of these guys anymore. I'll tell them about the love of Christ, and I'll proclaim the gospel. I'm not afraid for my life, because I know who Jesus is. I have two reactions when I read this. One is goosebumps. I want to be like that guy. Two is conviction. I'm really not all the time. Maybe you have the same. How does the Holy Spirit turn timid followers into bold witnesses? The same way he does everything else in your life. How does he lead you out of a life of sin? By convincing you of the reality of Jesus. Finally, power to witness for Jesus. So he wants you to, con- he wants you to believe in him, convinced. He wants you to live like him. And then he says he wants you to witness for him. Again, Acts 1-8, power to be my witnesses. Now, in our culture, it's common to hear people say things like this. Listen, my life is my witness. You know, I'm, I'm not, I want to push anything down anybody's throat. I want to be a pretty good person. Uh, and I want, if somebody asks, I might tell them I believe in God, but I'm not, I don't want to be in anybody's face, and I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable, and so I'm just trying to live a good life, and hopefully people will just kind of get it. Or maybe you've heard this phrase, often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel in everything you do. And if necessary, use words. Two problems with that. One is, Francis never said that. It's just a, like a like contemporary myth. Two is, it's impossible to preach the gospel without words. It is impossible to preach the gospel without words. What if I just stood up here and said, you know, you looked at me, we went home, boy, that was inspiring, right? You can't preach the gospel without words. Now, I agree you should live a good life. Can we just all agree God wants you to be nice people? He wants you to be good. Yes, agreed, totally. But the Holy Spirit doesn't come on us in power so we could just be nice. Wait and pray because the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll receive power to be good guys. No, to be my witnesses, which requires words. It requires words. The tongues that were given, let me just talk about the tongues briefly here. The tongues that were given, 
here are earthly languages that these men don't know. They haven't learned. But they're speaking in them. Why? For what purpose? To show off? To look spiritual? Remember, what's the job of the Holy Spirit? The primary job of the Holy Spirit is to make Jesus real to you and to others. Clear. So the tongues are given so that these people would hear and be clear about who Jesus is. Like if I just started speaking a language I don't know up here. The point would be only if it made Jesus more clear. I, don't speak, I speak a little bit of Spanish and like I can say certain things in the in language of Nyanja. I can say, Niku konda makaziwanga. That means, I love you, my wife. I can also say, nafanjala. That means I'm hungry. <laughs> That's about it. But these men are given languages they don't know. Why? To proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. If you see anything going on, people say this is in the spirit, and it's not pointing to Jesus, and it's not making him clear or real, then you ought to press pause and go, I don't know if this is the spirit. Because the spirit's job is not to freak people out, but to point to Jesus and to make him known and clear. Now we'll talk about the other gifts of tongues later in weeks to come. But that's what's happening here, and that's why it's happening here. The point is, those who believe in Jesus and live like Jesus are supposed to be witnesses for Jesus. And you can't do that. Th this doesn't mean, by the way, that you sort of, you know, that a witness for Jesus is not someone who talks in spiritual vagaries about love and peace and hope and sunshine. It means you talk about who Jesus Christ is, what the cross means, why the resurrection matters, how your sin's forgiven, what the purpose of your life is now. That's a witness to Jesus. That's why he says you'll be my witnesses. And let me look at verse, Acts chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Verse 31, really, when they had prayed... The place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You notice the progression there? Prayer, power, boldness. Now, didn't they, weren't they already filled with the Spirit? Didn't that happen a couple chapters earlier? Yes, but we continued to pray, God, give me courage. God, help me to see you clearly. God, help me to share your love with people. When they had prayed, the place was shaken, they were filled with the Spirit, and they continued to speak. Now, this, just so we're clear, this does not mean you should go home this afternoon and start knocking on your neighbor's doors and tell them they're going to hell. The Spirit does not come to make you obnoxious or a jerk either. It, but it does mean you begin to pray. You begin to pray. And I would, I'm guessing some of you, like me, are out there going, I don't experience that kind of power, Jeff. I don't experience that kind of power to believe and live and witness. What should I do? If that's your question, the answer I will tell you is to Pray. Just pray. Start making part of your daily routine, asking God to make the love of his son more real in your mind and heart and life. Spend this week doing that. And then as that begins to kind of fill your mind, as you begin to grow, start asking God, God, who in my life can I share this with? In a way that's not offensive or beat them over the head. I used to, when I coached football at Batavia High School years ago as a volunteer coach, I used to write little verse cards. I print out little verse cards, uh, Bible verses, like, by my God, I will defeat my enemies. I took verses out of context, but anyway, it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> and I would put them on their lockers and write little notes to the boys, you know. Some of the guys would take those verses and they would stick them in there. One, one guy put it in his, in, in his helmet, inside his pads, because he thought it made him hit harder or something. I don't know, right. But, there was, I, and, but, but I never really knew what kind of impact that was having until I went to a couple graduation parties for some of these guys. And there would be, you know, moms lay out their pictures and all that stuff, and that one, one young man had all the verses I'd ever given him. Had a chance to talk with him after he graduated about the love of Jesus, about what those verses really were talking about. Had a chance to pray with him and share with him the gospel and have him see him come to Christ, born again, made new. Took years, right? I wasn't, I'm not saying you start being a bull in a china shop or... But that's not really the danger for most of us. For most of us, we're like Lucy, aren't we? But they won't believe me. But they won't like it. But I'll feel awkward. As Lynn says, it doesn't matter. I want to convince you of who I am so that you live the way I would live if I were in your place. And I want you to share with the people around you how much I love them. What I've done for them. If you believe the Son of God would die to forgive your sin, how can you doubt that he would want you to share that with somebody? That makes no sense, does it? I died for you and for the world, but please keep that to yourself. Don't talk about it. 
I, I struggle with this too. It's easy to stand up here in church. I'm supposed to say it. What about my neighborhood? What about my street? What about yours? The neighborhood church vision, friends, is not about you being nice people in the neighborhood. It's about us being his witnesses. Jesus says it, right? The Holy Spirit will come on you in power. Why? For what purpose? So you would be his witnesses. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace poured out on us through Jesus. We thank you that you are making us new in our minds. You're convincing us and convicting us of your love and grace and mercy. And your spirit is helping us to live the way you want us to live. But Father, so many of us stop short. We're still too concerned about the opinions of others or afraid of how it might come across. We don't really talk about you. Forgive us for that. Give us your Holy Spirit courage to begin to pray. Who in our life can we share your love with? We pray this in your name and for your sake, Lord Jesus. Amen.